to Idea Zone with Kaleidoscope Enrichment and me, Sandy Roberts. Um, it's so nice to see you again. Uh, for those that know me, uh, I am a STEM educator and uh, Makerspace Coordinator in New Jersey. Uh, I am the Makerspace Coordinator for the Warren County Library System, which is pretty exciting because I get to work with people every day there. Not so much at the moment, but generally. Um, and then I also own Kaleidoscope Enrichment, which allows me to do STEM and Maker programs with homeschool groups, libraries, after school groups, um, clubs, all over the place. So um, it's really exciting to do what I get to do. And since I can't do it in person right now, I'm doing Idea Zone every week on my Facebook and YouTube sites at 4 p.m. so that we can all still be together. Um, I am also the author of the Big Book of Maker Camp projects. And some of the projects that we're doing today are actually from the book. So I'm just going to feature two of the projects from the book, but there's an entire section on weather um, equipment that you can build and weather stations that you can build. Everything from kind of the low tech, easy things that we're doing today, right on up to um, outdoor weather stations that use Microbit and Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Um, as kind of the brains of the unit. So definitely check that out if you enjoy today's projects. So as I mentioned, today we are going to do um, some weather-based projects. I can show you right in here. Okay, we're gonna actually do our thermometer and we're gonna do our barometer. Let me show you a little bit more of what they look like. Can I remember how to do this? <laughs> Give me a sec. Uh, there you go. So that's our thermometer and our barometer, and that's what we're going to be building today. Okay. I am following along, so if you have any questions or comments, I am watching, and uh, I am here to answer them if I can. Uh, I hope I can. <laughs> All right. Before we get into actually building our equipment today, I think we need to talk a little bit about the science behind how they work, because that will make it all make a lot more sense. So. Let us just um, switch over here and we're going to talk a bit. Okay. So, first we need to understand a little bit about how the sun actually warms up our planet. <laughs> okay. Energy travels 90 million miles to Earth. So, it's got a long way to go and it does take time for that to happen. It takes about eight minutes from the light, uh, for the light from the sun to get to the Earth. About 54% of that is invisible infrared uh, light or energy. 45% is normal visible light energy like we're used to. And 1% is UV or ultraviolet, and that's the stuff that gives you sunburns. Um, most of that energy, a lot of the energy is either reflected or absorbed. And that's what this picture kind of shows you over here, is that you have all this energy coming in. A bunch of it is absorbed by the land and oceans, okay, and that's part of what keeps us nice and toasty warm. But a lot is reflected back up into the atmosphere, reflected by clouds. Um, so not all of the energy that we get from the sun actually stays here on the planet. Plenty of it is radiated right back out into space. Basically, we operate like a, our oceans operate like a big mirror, just kind of letting some of that light and infrared energy bounce off of us. Um, Infrared energy, we feel as heat. It's invisible, but that's what we feel as heat. Um, a lot of it is absorbed, but about 30%, about a third of it is actually just reflected. Um, that is not enough infrared or heat energy to keep our planet warm and to keep all of us on our planet warm. <laughs> so that light is actually really important because that's what becomes heat for us a lot of times. If you look here, we have all these different wavelengths of energy. And you can see this tiny little part here is visible light, okay? And that's what we think of as light. Well, as it turns out, when that visible light is absorbed by an object or by land or by water or by you, um, <laughs> it is actually compressed, it's, or rather stretched, so that instead of being this wavelength, it becomes a longer wavelength. It becomes infrared, it becomes heat. And that's literally because that, that wave of energy has to move through an object. You could think of it a little bit like when you're in the pool and you try to walk through the pool, walk through the water, you kind of have to move a little more slowly and your steps are a little bigger. Well, it's kind of the same thing when that light gets absorbed by a dense material, it's gonna stretch out into a little bit longer wavelength and literally transform into heat. And that's pretty darn cool. 
That heat is then trapped by our atmosphere against the planet like a big bubble of warmth. And as a result, we're able to have life on Earth, which is pretty neat. Um, so how does the thermometer work? Well, based on this idea that the light and heat can be absorbed, right? Thermometers are filled with a liquid, usually a red colored alcohol these days, uh, like isopropyl alcohol. It used to be mercury, dangerous material. Now we know it's toxic, we don't use it anymore. But when that liquid gets warm, the tiny little molecules inside, the little particles that make up that liquid, get energized, okay? They absorb the thermal energy. And again, we have another transference of energy. We had light energy becoming thermal energy. Now thermal energy is becoming kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And as it absorbs more and more of that kinetic, that thermal energy and moves it to kinetic energy, those tiny little molecules start bouncing around and they've got nowhere to go because they're trapped in the column of the thermometer. So they spread out and they move up the column of the thermometer and that's what causes the liquid level to rise as the heat rises which is a pretty nifty thing this all has to do with density and this is going to come in with our next discussion in a moment too but basically the more molecules the more particles you can fit into any given space the more dense a substance is and usually the heavier it is you could think about this like if i gave you a garbage bag of feathers to carry around all day. Not so bad. Feathers are not very dense. That bag is not going to be very heavy. Maybe a little challenging to walk around with, but now imagine I gave you the same bag but filled with bricks. That is a lot more dense material and so that whole bag is going to be a lot heavier to hold. Well, as it turns out, warm liquids, warm gases, because they're energized, because they're bouncing around, um, they're less dense because those molecules spread out. Whereas cold gases and cold liquids are more dense and they pull together. And this is why when we add heat, right, we get evaporation of liquids. They go to a gas because they're moving away. Whereas when we get condensation, when things cool off, all those molecules come back together and move um, into the liquid phase. And the same thing happens with melting and freezing. But there's actually a density change with either each of those cha um, changes of matter. Another interesting thing to know is that a gas that's under pressure, like it's in a balloon and you're squeezing that balloon, it actually becomes more dense. There's less space for all those little molecules to be bouncing around. So I like to think about this a lot like if you look at kindergartners out there on a, a playground, right, running around, they're very energetic, they're spread out. But if you take them all and put them in a classroom, they're much more densely packed in there and they can't move around as much. So that's kind of the same thing that like pressure can actually make substances a little bit more dense too. All right, that's enough of a science lesson for the moment. We will return to this in a bit. Let me see if I can find the right window. Here we go. Okay, so the basic idea behind a thermometer, right, is that the liquid heats up expands, okay, because those molecules are absorbing that thermal energy, becoming kinetic energy, they're expanding, moving around, and they've got nowhere to go. They have to go up that tiny column that you give it. We can replicate this ourselves using stuff from around the house. Let me get my supplies. All right. Here we go. And you know what? I'm actually going to grab my little tray here so, so I can show you what we're doing. Here we go. This is pretty simple. You're going to want a glass jar, one that has a top. Um, the narrower, taller the jar, the better off this really is. But most importantly, you just want something that's got kind of straight sides. You want to take off any labels and it must have a lid. You're going to need some um, isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and a bit of water. Okay. We want this to we want to lower the density of the water a little bit so it really reacts to heat and that's why we're using some alcohol. If you don't have any, you can certainly try this with just straight up water. It just won't, you won't get as dramatic a change, okay? And you can also experiment with using straight alcohol, different percentages of alcohol. You know, does 50 work better or 75 or 90? Um, it can be really exciting to see how that can actually affect the uh, use of your thermometer. 
you're going to need, you may need a pair of scissors because I am going to be using duct tape to seal everything up. I recommend usually that you use clay for this, but I didn't happen to have any and I didn't feel like it was worth an extra trip out to the store to go and get some. But if you have some Play-Doh or clay sitting around, that's great. You could use hot glue. The idea is you're going to need to seal up any, um, any gaps when we build because we don't want, the only place we want the air getting in and out is on our thermometer. So we want to seal it up so we don't end up with <laughs> liquid everywhere. Um, we're also going to need a little bit of food dye. Um, I'm using green, but you can use any color. You don't need much, okay? And most importantly, a straw. This is not actually a very good straw to use. Where's my lighter color straw? I will get a lighter color straw. You want the lightest color straw you can get. White would be better. I happen to accidentally grab a purple one. But, um, okay, so once you have all your supplies together, we're gonna get building. This is actually very easy to build. Oh, something else to mention. You can use the scissors to poke our hole, but if you have an awl or a pair of, um, or a, a screwdriver, that will work a little bit better for this. Okay, so let me grab a lighter color straw and join you over here at the document camera. Okay, I'm just gonna put my supplies over here. Scissors, my straw, I'm gonna put my water and my alcohol and my food coloring. Okay, let me grab a lighter color straw because I'm not happy with that. My apologies for that. I was not paying very close attention. All right, this is a really easy project to make. All you're gonna do is start by taking the top off of your jar, okay? I am going to use a little screwdriver. You wanna put a hole in the top, and this is, you wanna be careful for. You may wanna wear gloves. You definitely wanna work on a protected surface like I'm working on a mat. <laughs> there you go. Now. Keep in mind, this can be very sharp underneath, so you're going to want to watch your fingers and be very careful about that. We need the hole to be big enough that you can get your straw into the hole. Mine isn't quite there, so I'm just going to take, again, working carefully, working on the table, perhaps wearing gloves. I'm just going to widen that hole a little bit like I did there, okay? Now my straw fits in there very easily. Okay, now my, uh, change of lighting a little bit. I need to fill this about a quarter of the way. We don't want it all the way filled. Just, you know, just about there. Quarter, one fourth. Good time to practice your uh, fractions. If you want, get out a ruler or measure how many ounces your jar is and you can be very particular about it. Today, I'm just gonna go ahead and eyeball it. So I'm gonna add a little bit of water first. I'm going to add my isopropyl alcohol next, okay, and then I'm going to go ahead and add just a tiny bit of my food dye. I'm going to get it all over my hands, as I always do. A drop or two is plenty. You just want to make sure it's a little darker than water so that as the uh, liquid rises in our straw for our thermometer, you can see it easily. Okay, look, and of course I did get dye all over my hands, right? <laughs> Every time. <laughs> all right, um, I'm gonna put these over on my tray. And all I need to do now is put this back on and push my straw back in. Now, you don't want your straw to be all the way against the bottom. You want it just below the surface of the water. Kind of just adjust that. This is where you're going to use your clay now because you're going to want to seal this area up. We don't want, um, well, we don't want our liquid to go evaporating. We don't want um, anything to get in there. And we don't want any spills. So I'm just going to do that. And then go ahead and, like I said, I just have some duct tape. So I'm going to go ahead and use some duct tape. You can use hot glue. You can use clay. You know. You can get creative with it. You do want to make sure it's as straight as you can get it, though. That's the important part. That's straight up and down and sealed well. Okay, I think it's a pretty good job there. Alrighty. Ta-da! 
So that's pretty easy, right? Alrighty, so let's switch back over and I'll show you how this works. Okay, I'm just gonna put this over here. So that's my little simple, simple thermometer. So what I want you to do once you build this is you're gonna wanna take it outside, maybe put it in a hot, sunny spot and watch what's ha what happens to the level your water inside your your straw should be just above the level of the water in your jar um, so you're gonna watch the level of the water inside the straw as it gets nice and hot uh, on you know in a sunny spot then bring it back inside and watch what happens you can try putting it in the freezer for a little bit and see what happens but you're gonna look for the movement of the water up and down that straw the further up it is the warmer it is the further down it is, the colder it is. You can also um, get yourself a regular thermometer and keep track of the temperature, okay? So like when it's 70 degrees, use a magic marker and just mark on the side that that's what 70 degrees looks like. And you can slowly calibrate, that's the scientific term we use for it, calibrate your homemade thermometer with a regular thermometer so eventually you just need this one, okay? You can also experiment with different size straws um, and different things like that. The only thing is, unfortunately, this isn't one that's very easy to use a paper straw because it could break down or a metal straw because you can't see through it. <laughs> so you do need a, a plastic straw that you can see through. Um, so that is our first project for today, a very simple thermometer that you can make yourself at home. Okay, we'll put that over here. Our second project today measures air pressure. It's called a barometer and it can help you predict if a storm may be coming or if the weather is going to be good. So let's talk about how that works. All right, so we were talking about density and density has a lot to do with how air pressure affects our weather. All right, atmospheric pressure is something you can look up. If you look on weather.gov, they'll give you whatever the atmospheric pressure is, the, um, the barometric pressure is what is often referred to it. Um, so when we have a low pressure system, it usually means a cloudy day or a storm is coming. A high pressure system usually means fair, calm weather. But why? Okay. <laughs> oh, I just realized I forgot my question mark. It's funny how that sort of thing, not you, you notice that sort of thing. Um, the important thing you have to understand is that air is all around us. Okay and weather moves in three dimensions. It moves up and down, side to side, all around. Not flat like on a picture like this. But the basic idea is that if a low pressure system moves into the area, the warm air that's close to the surface gets swept up, gets pulled up into the atmosphere. We have higher pressure, okay? The more pressure of gravity and the atmosphere on air closer to the Earth. And when all those particles are a little closer together and under pressure, it tends to be warmer. When a low pressure system comes in, it pushes that warm air up into the atmosphere, okay, where the particles can spread out, cool off, and any water traveling with the air condenses into clouds. So this means that now closer to the earth, it's getting cold, uh, way up in the atmosphere, clouds are forming, and eventually it's going to rain. Meanwhile, a high pressure system, when a high pressure system comes in, it actually pushes um, air down towards the surface. That increases the pressure near the earth. That increased pressure means warmer air. And often if it's pushing moisture too, water vapor down, it, that, um, that water vapor makes air feel warmer. The more humid air is, the warmer that air tends to feel, okay? Because those water particles in the air actually act, act as like a little bit of an insulator. It makes it even more dense, makes the air even more dense. The denser the air, the more heat it can hold, the warmer it feels. So when we have a low pressure system move in, you end up with bad weather. And when a high pressure system moves in, you end up with um, warm weather, nice calm weather. Now these pressure systems are really dependent on much larger weather movements like jet streams okay um 
So they're not super local, which is why you'll see things like we have some hurricanes coming this weekend down in the south of me. And they will travel based on these convection currents, this cold and warm air actually makes these systems move. So weather is fascinating. I don't have time to get into all of it, but that's the basics. So the barometer that we're gonna make basically uses a jar. And what happens is when a low pressure system, good weather is coming, the air pressure inside the jar actually ends up being a little higher than the outside of the jar, okay? And that's going to push the straw down. So when we see the straw go down, that's a low pressure system. That means we're gonna have, um, that, that means we're gonna have bad weather coming, right? Low pressure means bad weather. So when that straw goes down, whoop, that's gonna be a bad weather day. On the other hand, when a high pressure system comes in, the, the air outside the jar is gonna press down on our little balloon. It's gonna press down on the air in the jar, okay? And so the air pressure inside the jar is lower than outside, and it's going to move our little straw up. So that lets us know when the straw moves up, good weather is on the way, because the air outside from that high pressure system is pushing down on the top of our jar. Okay, so this will make a little more sense as we build it. So why don't we do that, right? Okay, here we go. So what do we need? I think you probably got the idea of what we need. But here we go. You're going to need another glass jar. This one I like to make sure, I, if I can, I get a nice wide mouth jar. It works a little bit better. You're going to need another straw. You're definitely going to need your scissors. You're going to need a balloon, the biggest one that you can get, okay? Then you need either rubber bands or, again, duct tape to hold the balloon in place. And you're going to need a, a little bit of invisible tape, okay? You also are going to want some paper and um, a pencil, and we'll go over exactly what you're going to do with that um, in a little bit. But let's get this built, okay? Here we go, moving my stuff over. And some tape rubber bands, and my straw. And actually, if you have extra straws around and you've got a bit of space for where you're gonna put this, more straws is better. The longer your straw is, the more accuracy you're gonna get. But we're gonna start just by taking our balloon. We're gonna cut the neck of the balloon off, but we want the nice big rounded portion. So we just cut that off, and we are very simply going to stretch it over nice and tight in this one you may want to wear goggles or glasses or get a parent's help okay you can stretch that over our jar now you want to try and get it as as smooth as you can that can be hard though sometimes but oh, i just tore my balloon right. oh it's totally torn one second let me grab an extra balloon Always have backup supplies, right? Always have extra supplies. There we go. Try that again. These things happen. These balloons are kind of old, to be honest. So if you can use fresh balloons, you're gonna be better off. Maybe not monkey with it as much as I was monkeying with it. All right, let's try it again. Let's see how smooth I can get this one. Oh yeah. There we go. That looks pretty good. So there we go. Just gonna put a rubber band on for now. Again, if you're gonna keep this around for a while, you may wanna tape it all down into place and make sure it's nice and uh, secure because you don't want that balloon popping off on you. And then all you're gonna do is I'm gonna take my straw. I'm actually gonna get rid of the flexi bit. And for this, you can totally use a, a paper straw. It doesn't matter if it's plastic for this one. You can't use a metal straw though, that won't work. I'm just gonna cut this so that I have a nice pointed arrow tip of my straw. It doesn't have to be perfect. Uh, so can you see that? I've got a point now. There we go. You can if you want to cut off the extra piece, you can too. I don't know, it bugs me a little bit. It might not bother you at all. But the idea is we want to make our straw into an arrow. And then it's very simple. We're just going to lay our straw on our um, jar. And we're going to use some tape. 
Now, the important thing is <laughs> to try to get this level, okay? You want to get this level to start with. And you want to make sure that your little point is pointing. Um, you don't want your point pointing up or down. You want it sideways. So I'm just going to go ahead and put it on. I'm get it as centered as I can. I need to do a good job centering this. This takes a little bit of... <laughs> there we go. And you might want to put a couple pieces on. And like I said, if you have space in your house or where you're putting your weather station, the longer you can make this, the better. I'm working kind of a tight space, so I'm going for a little bit smaller. Okay, that's it. It's basically constructed. Let's talk about how you use this, though, okay? We're going to go back over to the other view. So, now I've got my basic creation, my basic barometer. Moving all my stuff out of the way. But, let's see if I can get... You're going to put this somewhere in your house against a wall that you can hang a piece of paper behind your barometer, okay? And you're going to get a little pencil. Let's see, can I do this? I don't think, I don't know if I can do this. What does it say on this? You have comments. <laughs> okay, um, so you're going to put this on the wall, you're going to put this against it, and you're just going to come in, can I do it? And you're going to like mark, a little mark on there. And you're going to write the date. And you're going to go and find out what the barometric pressure is for today. So, for example, if I do this, um, doo -doo 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 -doo. I like to go to the National Weather Service. This is a weather.gov. Okay, so weather.gov. I put in my, my um, zip code. And if you look... It will tell you what the humidity is today, what the wind speed is, and right here, barometric pressure, okay? Always give it in inches because the original barometers were water, and the air pressure outside the tube of water, the column of water, would push down on that water, and they'd measure, physically measure the inches difference. Um, so I know that wherever my little arrow is hitting today, that's 30 inches um, and that's what I need to know. So let's, I'm just going to show you real quick again. Again, pictures worth a thousand words. So you can see that straw, you just want to be able to mark on your paper behind you the date and what the um, pressure is, the barometric pressure is. But anytime that that straw dips down, that's a low pressure system and low pressure systems always mean bad weather. And when the straw goes up, that's going to mean good weather. Okay? And I am switching back. Here we go. So, you're going to find a nice spot. You're going to put yourself a piece of paper behind your barometer. You're going to mark where you are today. Go and look up and find out what that pressure is, what the barometric pressure is. Maybe write the date. And then you can monitor it. If you pair this nicely with your... Um, thermometer, you will very quickly be able to predict storms because when the temperature drops, right, and the uh, pressure drops, you know that a storm is coming, okay, because that's cold and the pressure is low and that is exactly what you're going to expect before something like a thunderstorm. And then we're going into thunderstorm season in my area, like they're actually saying one is coming this weekend, so I can put these tools to good use right away. Okay, so that's our two basic projects for today. And like I said, these are easy things that you can find around the house. So I'm just going to remind you, if you have any questions, now's the time to ask, okay? And I will answer any questions about building these. If you enjoyed this, and I hope that you did, keep in mind, where's my book? Here it is. That in the big book of Maker Camp projects, okay, um, let's see. Is that the right one? Nope. <laughs> Big Book of Maker Camp Project. You can get it on Amazon and get it on Barnes and Noble. Um, it's a great gift if you've got a birthday coming up. But I have also in here, you can make, I can't do this upside down so well. But <laughs> here I have making a computerized weather station. Um, all kinds of nice computerized weather stations that you can build. I'm just gonna put it down. I'm not good at doing this upside down. Um, here's an anemometer, okay, to measure wind. 
This one is a sundial um, to actually measure, you know, the time. We've got a wind vane in there. So lots of different things that you can build to check out the weather if you want to grab that book. It's also available in lots of libraries. So um, you can often get it that way too. All right. Well, I hope that you enjoyed this. If you're looking for more ideas, you can always go to my website, kaleidoscopeenrichment.com. I have a blog and I have lots of cool stuff there. Check out my YouTube channel. I put lots of videos there. I put probably at least three different STEM or maker videos a week that you can try out. Um, my name is Sandy Roberts. My company is Kaleidoscope Enrichment. My book is the big book of Maker Camp Projects. And I encourage you to try some fun science and engineering to get out and make stuff and to be as creative as you possibly can. I will see you next week back here at 4 p.m. Uh, for lots more fun. Take care, stay safe, and stay healthy.